Good morning and welcome. It doesn't matter to us if you're a regular or a visitor. If you're watching later on a recording, that doesn't matter either. It's nice to have you join with us. My name is Rob and I'll be leading our service this morning. So why are we here today? I guess there are lots of answers to that question, like mum made me or I always go to church on Sundays. The reason why <coughs> War Hope Prezies have services is because what we believe about God. We believe that there is a God, obviously. We believe that he revealed himself to us through his son Jesus and through his word. We believe that the Bible helps us to understand more about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And because of who God is and what he has done for us in Jesus, we want to honour him today. So we're going to listen to some great songs, which you can sing along to at home. No masks required. That's great. We're going to hear the Bible read. We're going to talk to God in prayer. And we're going to hear his word explained to us. But right now, let's talk to God in prayer. Oh Lord, you are wonderful. You are mighty, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing. You are the source of light and of love and the giver of all good things. You are the just one who calls evil to account. You are the pure one who wants your people to be holy like you. You have not remained remote and hidden, but you have made yourself known to us. As we sing and read and pray and listen this morning, help us to be focused on what you are saying to us and help us to be open to, show, to you showing us the way so that we can follow Jesus. Amen. We're actually going to hear now from the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles there, it uh, will be up on the screen, but from Daniel chapter 2 um, in the Old Testament. And Timothy's going to read that for us. The words will be up on the screen. Today's reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams that troubled him, and, his, and sleep deserted him. So the king gave orders to summon the magicians, mediums, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. When they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream and am anxious to understand it. The Chaldeans spoke to the king. Aramaic begins here. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, My word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a garbage dump. But if you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you will receive gifts, a reward and great honour from me. So make the dream and its interpretation known to me. The servants answered a second time. May the king tell the dream to his servants and we make the known the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain you are trying to gain some time because you see that my word is final. If you don't tell me the dream, there is one decree for you. You have conspired who tell me something false or fraudulent until the situation changes. So tell me the dream and I will know you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king. No one on earth can make known what the king requests. Consequently, no king, however great or powerful, has ever asked anything like this of any magician, medium or Chaldean. What the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make it known to him except the gods, whose dwelling is not with mortals. Because of this, the king became violently angry and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. The decree was issued that the wise men were to be executed, and they searched for Daniel and his friends to execute them. Thanks, Timothy. Some uh, some challenging words in that uh, <laughs> in that reading, uh, and we're going to look forward to uh, 
Samuel making sense for us uh, of that in just a moment. So he's going to bring the message uh, from God's word to us. Uh, but let me pray for him before he does that. Father, we, uh, we thank you for uh, Daniel. We thank you for the story that uh, Timothy's just read to us uh, from the book about Daniel. Lord, we ask that um, as Samuel comes in and uh, explains that to us and teaches us from that, Lord, that uh, his words will be clear and, Lord, that you'll help us to be focused and concentrating on what's said and learning from that, Lord, the lessons that uh, you want us to know and to apply in, in our lives. So, Lord, uh, we ask that blessing now on, on Samuel as he preaches. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Rob. I, I tell you, who would want to be a wise guy? Maybe that's where the whole phrase comes from, don't be a wise guy. It doesn't pay. Uh, it's not the best option in the world. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, what's wrong with Uncle uh, King Nebuchadnezzar? Actually, I doubt his people call that him to his face. Sorry, I shouldn't say the word uncle. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he's not sleeping. He's having a rough time uh, because he keeps having this vivid dream at night. Have you ever woken up from a dream that just seems so real? And you wake up and the relief, uh, just knowing that it wasn't real, it was just a dream. But, but King Nebuchadnezzar, he knows this is not just some ordinary dream. It keeps coming back to him. And, and it's really quite threatening. It's scary. Well, thankfully, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's got the team for the job. He's got a whole team of magicians, mediums, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. And knowing these Chaldeans, they are known for being the best astrologers in the business. So he calls them all in. And in they come, right? Now, the newbies, remember the newbies we heard about last week? Daniel and his three mates, they're not invited. Perhaps these oldies, these old guys, they're a bit miffed about their newfound favour with the king, you know, those new upstarts. I mean, let's, let's not deal with those guys. You know, they're not invited. Well, you know what? We'll sort this little problem out without them. We, we can sort it out. Let, let's listen to the king and his little problem, shall we? So anyway, there's the king, and he watches them file in. They're confident. They've got these wise, mysterious, knowing looks on their faces. I don't know how they do it, but they, you know, they practice looking wise and sensible. And they walk in, and they await his pleasure. We get to verse 3. I have had a dream, and I am anxious to understand it. And this, and this noble, aged gathering of wise guys, well, indeed, You've clearly called the right people. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. I mean, this is what we do, right? Let us know your ever-enduring highness and we will let you know. Now, to call the king, uh, may the king live forever, might be the normal greeting, but perhaps it's a little unfortunate. May the king live forever? Really? Uh, considering what the king's been dreaming, that traditional greeting may not have been the best choice of words. Anyway, the king's like, this is huge. I've got to know if these guys can tell me what they say is the truth. How can I know they really do have the wisdom of the gods? I know just the thing. Verse 5, what does he say? My word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation... You will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a garbage dump. And this, this is no idle threat, because later on we learn clearly about this king's inclination to violence. He, he is a violent guy, right? You tell me both the dream, he says, and the interpretation, or I will kill you horribly and then shame even your memory. However... However, if, if you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you'll receive gifts, a reward and great honour from me. So the, the stick and the carrot, right? I mean, it's what, you, it's what you guys do, isn't it? You consult the dead, you've got connections with the gods, you've got magic, you read the stars, years of learning, all of you. So, verse 3, make the dream and its interpretation known to me. No biggie. If you are who you say you are. Um, uh, uh, King, um, just, just let us know what the dream is and, and we'll sort it out for you. No stress. And it's, it's like this 
dark cloud forms behind the eyes of the king. What did he say? My word is final. He says, verse 8, you're stalling for time. If you don't tell me the dream I've been dreaming, my one decree still stands. Or you don't stand, that is. I'm starting to think you're going to just make it all up. You all just work together to lie until you get out of this sticky mess. So tell me the dream, and then I'll know you can give me the interpretation. Now, at this point, you can imagine they walked in looking all confident and proud and all you know, mysteriously knowing, and I imagine their faces are going a little green at this point. Your Majesty, no one on earth can do what you're asking, O King. That's why no, that's not why no, no king has ever asked what you're asking. Only the gods can do what you ask, and we know that they don't dwell here among us. <laughs> of course, King, you, you can't, you can't do that. And and you can imagine the king's being told what he cannot do, and and the vein on his head starts pulsing, and his eyes start turning red. And get me Ariok, the captain of the guard. Here are your orders, as he walks in. Find me every wise man of Babylon, round them up, all of them, and have them executed. And so Ariok, he heads back to his office, and he takes up the role of wise men of Babylon, and, and the list of those who are to be torn limb from limb. And guess whose name has just been added to the list? The ink, it's still wet where it reads Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hey kids, uh, what are you going to draw for this scene? Are you going to draw the king sitting up in his bed looking scared and bags under his eyes because he's not getting any sleep? Or perhaps the king with a red face, you know, a bursting vein in his head, and he's, he's glaring at his wise men all green-faced and shaking at their knees? You know those wise men? They weren't so wise after all. They greeted the king by saying, may the king live forever. But the king's dream, well, it's making him wonder how long he's going to live. He's scared. But now he is angry because it appears that these wise men, you know, they're, they're not so wise after all. They don't really know what the gods are thinking. Of course, you and I, we know why, don't we? Because <laughs> their gods aren't real. The God of the heavens, the one true God, he is the one giving the king dreams. So who can reveal the meaning of the dream? Yeah, you're right. Only God can. But what about Daniel and his mates? They're not God. It's not their fault. And the king is too powerful for them. I mean, he's got the army, he's got guards, he can do whatever he wants, right? What can Daniel and his mates do when someone as powerful as the king of an empire wants them dead? Well, we're going to see. Uh, let's have a look what happens in scene two. Verse 14. Now, Daniel, he's working in his office at the palace, and he doesn't know what's going on in the throne room because he wasn't invited. And he looks up as Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, walks in holding chains. Uh, what's up, Ariok? Sorry, king's orders. I'm to collect all the wise men of Babylon and have them ripped apart. I know you're only new here, mate, but you're on the list. And Daniel's like, but, but why? Can you just tell me, why is the king's decree so harsh? And there's no harm in saying, so Ariok, he explains the king's mysterious dream and failure of the wise men. And the shocked look on Daniel's face hardens into determination as he listens. Look, 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 Ariok, just take me to the king. And I'll ask, ask for some time to give him what he wants. Well, can't do any harm. I mean, the king wants his dreams interpreted. So Ariok says, all right, let's go. And Ariok escorts Daniel to the king. And Daniel, he buys himself and his mates some time. All right, kids, this is a really short scene. You may or may not want to draw another picture for it. What could you draw? Maybe the guard, Ariok, as he walks into Daniel's office holding chains to take him away. Daniel, a surprised look on his face as he looks up from the desk. Ariok, maybe with a long, sad face, unhappy with the job he's been given. But what makes Daniel so different? 
Sure, he's smart. He, he talks to Arioch with tact and discretion, the Bible says, which means he was polite and he was clever when talking to the guard. But being smart can't help you know what the king's been dreaming if the king doesn't tell you. He, is he just delaying the inevitable? Well, there's a short scene. It doesn't take us long to find out exactly what Daniel does next. Scene three. What does Daniel do? Verse 17, he goes home from the palace. He calls his Hebrew mates, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he tells them, the king's going to have us all killed unless, unless God, in his mercy, reveals to us the mystery of the king's dream. And so what do they do? Oh, there and then they pray. They get down on their knees and plead with the God of the heavens for mercy. They pray that he, the one true God, would reveal the mystery of the king's dream and its interpretation. They pray to the one who really is in control. Anyway, during the night, Daniel, he, he goes strangely quiet. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they stop. They, they look at each other. They look at Daniel. Well, what's going on? Because Daniel, he's, his eyes are drooping, and it's almost as if he's gone to sleep. And then into this silence, he cries out. Verse 20. May the name of God be praised forever. His wisdom and power, they belong to him. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and light dwells with him. Ah, oh, Daniel says, I offer thanks and praise to you, O God of my ancestors, because you have given me wisdom and power, for you have let me know what we asked of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. Ah, oh, his prayer there, you should read it again, look at it in your in, in, in Bible. It's not the king who will live forever. The wise men were just blowing smoke up the king's chimney, right? That's, that's, not, that's not what's happening. The name, the deeds, the reputation of God endures. And he will be praised forever and ever. God is the source of wisdom and power. And the world and its seasons move because of his will. Kings, uh, you know, they come and go at his discretion. Those who know, they only know because God lets them know. He alone gives wisdom and knowledge. Huh. These, uh, these poor Chaldean charlatans, they, they can't know unless God wants them to know. God alone reveals the deep and hidden things. He alone can reveal the dreams of man. And so Daniel and his mates, they rejoice and they praise God. They probably wake up their poor neighbours. <laughs> they celebrate the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Jacob and Isaac, the one true God, the God of the heavens. Hey, kids, have you got time for another drawing? I reckon a good drawing would be uh, Daniel's mates, they fall off their chairs when Daniel jumps up to praise God after his vision. Or maybe um, you could draw those magicians they're just, and they don't know. that They're like they've got blindfolds on. They don't really see what's going on because they can't help the king. God alone has power and wisdom. And the only way for anyone to have wisdom and power is if God gives it to them, which means any king, any government, Anyone who has knowledge and power only has these things because God lets them. He gives it to them. Anyway, Daniel and his mates are headed for a messy end. But God has revealed the king's dream and what it means to Daniel because God is in control. He is always in control. You know what? Even right now in our lives, no matter what's going on, God is still in control. Well, I wonder what all the fuss is about. What has the king been dreaming? Kind of in the story, we've kind of been holding out. We don't hear about what it is till right at the end. But already we've got a really big hint about what it might be. Anyway, Daniel, he has to get back to the king first. So he has to find Arioch. Scene four, back at the king's palace. Back at the king's palace. Oh, I might get the next slide up. Here we go. And so Daniel, verse 24, he goes to Arioch. The one with the unfortunate job of making the wise men of Babylon uh, even more unfortunate. And seeing Arioch, Daniel's like, hey, Arioch, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king and I will give him the interpretation. And old mate Arioch, oh, yeah, he's been around a bit. He gets a glint in his eyes. Like, ah, now if the king, 
if the king's angry because no one can tell him his dream, there might be a bit of credit for the one who brings the man who can. So Arioch, he doesn't delay, he doesn't hang around. He quickly takes Daniel before the king and listen to what he says in verse 25. O king, I have found a man among the Judean exiles who can let the king know the interpretation. Talk about taking some of the credit. He knows how to get ahead in the world. Ariok hasn't found anyone. Daniel sought him out. But, but worse, listen to the words of Ariok. Where was wisdom found? Where was the answer supposedly sourced? Not from amongst the Chaldean wise guys, but from among the Judean exiles. I mean, the king, he wants the interpretation all right, but only from someone he can trust, someone who, who can prove that he knows what it means. But I'm sorry, but if the Chaldean wise man couldn't do it, what hope does a Judean exile have? And to make it worse, the king has set an impossible test. Do you remember what it was? Well, the, the king's quick to remind us as we enter the final scene back where we began at the king's throne room. Verse 26, the king looks down at Daniel. Are you able to tell me the dream I had and its interpretation? Can you, a foreigner, a captive of our great conquest, a man of a fallen, puny God, can you solve a mystery? Even all the magicians, the mediums, the sorcerers, the Chaldean astrologers of Babylon couldn't? <laughs> You can imagine all the eyes of the courtroom looking at this Johnny come lately as the king asks, can, can you do this? Can you do this? I'd be shaken in my shoes. But, I, but imagine the look on the king's face, the look on Ariok's face, as Daniel clearly, openly says, well, actually, no, no, no I, I can't. I imagine Ariok probably puts his face in his hands. Like, oh, man, I'm dead. I'm so dead. Oh, man, that, this is so embarrassing. I'm gone. Um, uh, the king, that vein in his head, starts throbbing again as the nearest guard starts walking up, pulling out his sword to lop his head off. You know. But Daniel, he hasn't finished. Look at verse 27. No, 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 your majesty, I can't. No one can make known to the king the mystery he has asked. But... But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Remember, the book of Daniel isn't about Daniel. It's about a conflict between God and anyone else who would try their hand at being God. It's a conflict between the gods of Babylon, the king of Babylon, the culture of Babylon, the Babylon, the, the evil rebellious empire. It's a battle between this and the one true God, the God of the heavens. No wise man, medium, magician or diviner could make known the mystery of the king because they are not God. They don't know God. God hasn't revealed the truth to them. And so Daniel, quite humbly but terribly truthfully, says, No, O king, no man can do as you ask, but the real God, the God of the heavens, he can. In fact, verse 28 it is our God, the God of the Hebrews, who has given you these dreams so that you, King Nebuchadnezzar, might know what will happen in the last days. As for me, uh, Daniel says in verse 30, as for me, this God has revealed to me both your dream and the interpretation, not because I'm wiser than anyone else on the earth, but that you might know what this dream is all about so that, listen to this, so that you, even you, might understand the thoughts of your own mind. Did you? Did you notice the joke? No one's wise enough to know the mind of the king. Not even you, O oh king. Imagine that. Daniel tells the king he doesn't even know his own mind. Oh man, it's so cheeky, this book of Daniel. It, it's full of mockery of this human rebellious king and kingdom that stands opposed to God and his authority. God is in control, not King Nebuchadnezzar. Not only can't he find a wise man in Babylon, he can't even understand the thoughts of his own mind. Now here's the rub. 
Here's the challenge for us as we read the book of Daniel. Often when we read it, we get ourselves all in a fuss over this dream and what it means, but this dream is not the central point of this story. What has the whole chapter been about? It's not that they know. It's not that we know. Only God knows. Why? It's because the Babylon, the Babylonians and, and her king are not in control. God is in control. That's why he knows. He is the one who what sets up kings and removes kings in, in Daniel's prayer of praise. And this tells us an important bit about this dream. The point of the dream is the same as the rest of the chapter. Actually, we should get back to Daniel. We've left him standing there before the king. That's a bit rude. We should, we should get back to what he's saying. What are you saying? That Daniel? All right. So Daniel, after giving God credit, God the glory, after taking a dig at the whole Babylonian empire through its wise man and the king, finally Daniel takes pity on the king and tells him, verse 31, you dream? Well, suddenly before you was a terrifying colossal statue, its head pure gold, its chest and arms silver, its stomach and thighs bronze, its legs were made of iron and its feet a mixture of iron and fired clay. And, O King, even as you watched, a stone with no human hand involved came crashing down and smashed the feet of iron and fired clay and the whole statue, poof, it shattered, only to be blown away like chaff from the summer threshing floors. It blew away in the wind, but that stone... That stone of destruction, it grew and grew and grew until it became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Dreams are crazy, aren't they? But this dream isn't just a dream because you had too much coffee before you went to bed. Right? It's God speaking to this poor, tired, confused king who doesn't even understand his own mind and God wants this king in all his worldly power and might, the one who's conquered the world as far as I know, to know where power and might really does come from. Listen to the meaning of the dream. And it all starts pretty well for Nebuchadnezzar, who's probably still trying to process the whole, how it's even possible for a Hebrew to tell him his dream, right? But Daniel, verse 37, he, he doesn't stop, right? The God of the heavens has given you sovereignty, power, strength and glory. Who gave it to him? The God of the heavens. Wherever people live or wild animals or birds of the sky, God has handed them over to you and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Sorry, Daniel, we're going to interrupt you again, but, but what's the point here? Why is King Nebuchadnezzar the big king, the big, the great king, the head honcho, the, the one who has sovereignty, power, strength and glory? Well, because and only because the God of the heavens has given all of this to him. God is in control over Babylon and her king. Sorry, Babylon, uh, sorry Daniel, keep going, mate. We'll, we'll get back to you. So Daniel says, but O king, after you will come another kingdom, not as good as yours, and then another. And then another. The bronze kingdom will rule the whole earth, but it likewise will be crushed by a kingdom of iron, uh, overcome by a kingdom of iron, but it will be divided, and divided it too will be brittle and ripe for what comes next. We should read verse 44 because it's pretty cool. This is the end of it, right? In the last days, in the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. This kingdom is not a kingdom of man. No hand of man was involved in setting up this kingdom. It wasn't cut by hands. It, this, this kingdom is not like the kingdoms of men. It's a kingdom greater than all the others that have come before it. It's a, kung, it's a kingdom which will bring all human kingdoms to an end. It's a kingdom which will endure forever. And King Nebuchadnezzar, what can he do? What can he say? I mean, he said, this guy's passed the test. He said what his dream wants was that he kept daily to himself and he's given the interpretation. So he says, you know what? Your God is indeed God of gods, Lord of kings. 
and a revealer of mysteries, since you were able to reveal this mystery. You know, we can get all fixated over this dream and, and how it actually accurately depicts history from that point on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty certain. We know who it was that brought the downfall of the Babylonians. But even then, after the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks came next. And after the Greeks, who was it? Do you know? Alexander the Great, who was after him? The, the empire divided between his generals, and then the Romans came in. And we know also, however, who the stone, unformed by human hands, was. He who brought in the everlasting kingdom. And knowing that God in his sovereignty brought Jesus at the time he promised in the book of Daniel all those years earlier, what's the point? It should grow our faith, our confidence, our hope for the here and now because we learn from Daniel chapter 2 something super important. It's the one message of Jan Daniel chapter 2. The God of Daniel. The God of the Hebrews is the God who sent Jesus, and it is this God who is greater than the Babylonian gods, greater than the Persian gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, and yes, even greater than the governments and powers that exist today. Time and time again, those in power, they think they are in control. Those in power thought that through their might they would conquer, they would gain control, they would write their own destinies, and yet... We know only one kingdom will last. Guys, today, no matter what's going on in your life, in my life, no matter what's going on and happening in our world, no matter what governments do, no matter what the great corporations decide, no matter how corrupt or oppressive the dictator or our workplace boss, they are not ultimately in control. Who handed Israel over to Babylon? Who handed the special articles from the temple of God over to Babylon? Who alone could give and reveal the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar? God did. The God of the heavens. The God who was above and beyond all creation, and he still rules. As God's people, we need to take comfort in the fact that no matter what the chaos we see around us, it only looks like chaos. For the real God, the God of the heavens, is in control. His kingdom, the kingdom he establishes, endures forever. And as his children, our place is secure. Let's pray. God, you are good all the time. And God, you can use even the evil, the rebellious, the destructive, the apparently chaotic in this world to achieve your good purposes. You are greater than the kings. You are greater than empires. You are greater than the biggest corporations. You are a bit greater than famines and pestilence and pandemics. You are in control of it all. And you have established in your son Jesus, the one who came when you promised all those years before, to make a kingdom that overcomes all other power. And I thank you, Lord, that in your Son, Jesus, you have invited us to be a part of his kingdom, co-heirs in Christ. Well, we thank you that we don't need to overcome through violence, through threat of sword, through manipulation, through conquest. We conquer by holding on to Jesus and trusting that he is good and reigns beside you at your right hand in heaven. And one day we will see everything put at his feet. And together we will declare, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, till that day, give us comfort, give us peace, give us calm, that you are good, that you are still in control, and that we need to hold on to you and trust you and be He who you call us to be, children of the kingdom. So we pray this in Jesus, our King, our King's good and strong name. Amen. Well, if you've been joining us today on Facebook, on live stream, or perhaps you're watching a recording, thanks for being with us. You know, we really do appreciate our feedback. And so please give us a like and uh, share, we'll hope, Prezi, with, with your friends. If you've got any questions, 
You could leave them on the, in the comments section and we'll get back to you. You can also contact us on the contacts page on our website. Just search for War Hope Presbyterian. Next week, we'll be continuing our series uh, from Daniel. And if you've taken a sneak peek, it's pretty fiery stuff, but all under God's control, of course. More on that next week. For now, uh, let me close in prayer and then we'll shut down the live stream and stop recording. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that very strong message today from Daniel, that you are in control. Lord, that uh, you sit outside of uh, everything that happens on this earth. And Father, you're uh, God over it all. Father, we thank you that your plan is uh, moving forward. And Lord, we look for that great day when Jesus will return and we'll, we will be together with you in glory. Father, as we go from here today, bless us, help us to shine for you as your children. And we ask these things in Jesus' name who died for us. Amen.